Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. It doesn't matter where I'm employed as a park ranger. What does matter is my secret job, the thing that I do when I'm off the grid, so to speak. A werewolf started appearing about six months ago, and I'm still not sure why. At first, we got calls from visitors saying they encountered grizzly bears, or something approximating one, deep in the forest. For the first few months, we got maybe a dozen calls. After that, things really started to ramp up, daily, or rather, nightly sightings. Despite that, no one could really get a good look at the thing everyone assumed to be bare. Then my boss showed up, a man I rarely saw. He tossed a trank dart gun at me and told me to head into the woods. Whatever you do, don't kill the thing. Based off the information we've been able to gather, this is no damn bear. Something possibly supernatural. Does this have anything to do with Elijah's disappearance last month? Something killed Elijah, and we never found the body. James only gave a slight nod, something that could be denied later if asked. The less you know, the better, Liam. Just take your truck and head into the woods. I'll mark the most recent sighting on your map, James said, crossing his arms and giving me a look that told me not to ask any more questions, but I couldn't help myself. Guess some weird government agency is involved in this if you're telling me not to kill it. You'd think the safety of the visitors would come first, I said, but James cut me off. Now, officially, that's none of our business, Liam. Just take in orders. You'd be wise to do the same. So I closed my mouth and got to work, loading my vehicle with some last-minute things I thought I might need, food or water or binoculars. Then I got in the truck and drove down the winding road. I decided to not get on the walkie because I didn't want to alert James. My plan was this. Pick up Bill, my partner in crime more or less, at his usual patrolling location, then head off to where the location James marked on the map and see if we couldn't tag team this thing. I caught Bill just sitting in his patrol truck, reading an Agatha Christie novel and smoking a cigarette. I remember him telling me how relaxing he found it. Being out here, not a care in the world. Tending to his biological needs, the cigarette, and the needs of his higher brain, the Agatha Christie novel. Hey, Bill, we got a situation James wants us to look into. Bill looked up from his novel, mildly irritated. What kind of situation? Gotta trank something. You know, that thing that everyone thinks is a bear, but probably isn't. Why trank instead of kill? Yeah, I was wondering that, too. Anyway, hop in, good buddy. We got a long night ahead of us, and that's putting it really mildly. Bill got in, and we drove off in the direction of the last sighting. I filled Bill in on what little I knew. Guess the thing that really concerns me is why now? Why a month after Elijah's death? Bill asked, thumbing through the book in his hands but not really reading it. That caught my attention, too. I don't know the reason. I just know that something fishy is going on. Then that's when we saw it. A large, hairy beast. Running on all fours, then randomly standing upright and roaring. Our headlights seemed to confuse the thing. Bill took out his pistol, rolled down the window, and fired. Bill, what the F are you doing? No lethal force is allowed on this thing. We gotta use the trank gun. The thing, which upon closer inspection looked exactly like a werewolf, just roared and charged at the truck, grabbing its bottom and shaking it violently until Bill and I were completely disoriented. It then leapt into the trees. What the F is wrong with you? I said to Bill again once my head stopped spinning. I said no lethal weapons. Sorry, Liam. Just got rattled is all. Wasn't going to get turned to human paste because a pair of government-issue sunglasses told us not to us actual bullets. Bill replied, face flushed. Well, after that I began to drive again, keeping our eyes peeled for the werewolf. We heard howls coming from the infinite line of trees to our left. No matter how much we combed the woods, we didn't find anything. This went on for several nights, experiencing horrific sightings of the massive man-wolf. 
I went by myself after the first night because I didn't trust Bill not to fire bullets at the thing. James was ripping me a new ass because I couldn't track the damn thing down at least, not keep it in my sights long enough to track it. On the fourth night, I sat in my truck on the side of a wide road, scanning the eerily still line of palm trees. My ears pricked as I heard the soft crunch of twigs as tired crushed them. I peeked in the rearview mirror and saw a sleek black car parking behind me. A short woman with red hair came out of the car, using precise movements so that not one ounce of energy was wasted. Are you Liam? The woman asked, popping into my window like she was a cop about to give me a ticket. I heard the trees rustle behind her and began to perspire a little on my forehead. I'd tell you that you shouldn't be out this way, ma'am, since we've seen had a few bear sightings out this way, but I started. I don't mean to be blunt, but I outrank park rangers. Again, not trying to be a jerk, just stating a fact. The woman seemed fairly young, and her smile sent a shiver down my spine because it was so emotionless. She explained to me what was going on. She worked for a government agency, one I hadn't heard before, and they had been working on a serum to reverse the transformation of the werewolf. They were hoping I could sedate the thing before it did any real damage or chose to move on to an even broader wilderness. There has been a reason why this werewolf has been so good at evading you, and I'm not sure it has anything to do with it having preternatural abilities, the woman said. She finally introduced herself as Sarah Perkins. Here, take this trank gun. It comes with a special tranquilizer that will not only sedate the werewolf, but also hopefully reverse his transformation. It hasn't been tested on his kind, since we believe he is the only one of his kind that exists, Sarah said and handed me a much larger gun than I had, which had a small tube filled with yellow liquid fitted onto the top. She had one for herself too. We hurried into the woods, following the howls until I felt like we were dangerously close. Sarah scanned the environment, looking more vigilant than nervous. Okay, maybe a little nervous, but she hit it remarkably well. As for me, I was terrified. Not afraid to admit that since I didn't have special government training to deal with a friggin' werewolf. The trees all around us began to rustle, and before I could really get my bearings, the massive hairy beast shot from the top of one of the trees and landed on the ground. My hands shook. I tried to steady my gun, except my nerves wouldn't let me. Steady, I said. Steady. But I just couldn't calm my shaking hands. The beast slowly moved closer on all fours, fierce yellow eyes fixed on me. A pound of drool must have escaped from its jaws, hanging from them in thick, disgusting streams that made me want to vomit. It swiped the air with massive claws, growling. Just as I thought I was a goner, I heard the sound of a whisper whizzing by at about a hundred miles an hour, landing in the beast's hairy, bulging neck. Without thinking, I fired my own gun. The dart landed in the thing's abdomen. It growled weakly and collapsed onto the ground. Sarah didn't waste any time. She ran toward the thing and placed a small chip deep into the fur of its right arm. Tracking device, she said as its breathing slowed. The trank or transformation dart did what she claimed the beast began to shrink. The fur started to go back into the skin. It all happened so quickly that at first I didn't believe what I was seeing. I went over to the man, who shivered and rubbed his arms. The transformation had taken a toll on him. It took me a minute, but I recognized the man. Elijah, I said under my breath. You're alive. How is this even possible? Well, congratulations, Sarah, a man's voice said from behind. You got to Subject X first. You won the bet. I turned around. Bill. Bill, what is going on? I asked, tone clearly frazzled. Sarah jumped in. We work at the same agency. We had a little bet going. Whoever got to the werewolf first could do with it as it pleased. Kill it or trank it and put a tracking device on it. Of course, my way aligned with the agencies. Bill here is a renegade, wants to eliminate everything in sight. Bill gave a soft chuckle. Well, guess I got what I want either way, Bill said, grinning and patting me on the back as he walked past me. He knelt in front of Elijah, 
and seemed to pluck one of the remaining werewolf hairs from one of its forearms and put it in a small glass vial. Then Sarah and Bill seemed to be talking in code, and I couldn't at all parse what they were saying. Bill came up to me afterward. Okay, Liam, we better get out of here before that trank dart wears off. Looks like the serum's effects were only temporary. It'll completely change back into werewolf form in less than 15 minutes. Part of the transformation has already begun. The sedative will wear off in about 10 after that. But don't worry, we can track the thing with the device Sarah put on it. So we all left. Sarah in her sleep government vehicle, and Bill and I in our park ranger truck. You can't tell James that I work for a government agency that hunts a werewolf, he said. Now I wanted to kill the thing, wipe it off the map, but Sarah had other plans. I have to respect the bet. I lost. She won. Which means that Elijah will be roaming the woods, and we have to track him every night, study him. After a while, once the agency has all the information it needs, it will either give a kill order, and I can deliver a bullet to the thing's brain, or it will come up with a serum that will permanently erase Elijah's werewolf tendencies. So with Bill's help, I track Elijah every night using regular trank darts to sedate him. We take hair and skin samples, put everything into stainless steel containers that get shipped back to a secret government lab. They are working on a serum just like Bill said, one which will be permanent. I've learned to accept Bill's new identity, aspiring werewolf killer. I'll deal with it when the time comes. I think I have additional problems to the fate of Elijah because I've gone to the workman's cabin seeing Bill with those strange yellow eyes more than once. I'm not sure if he is a full-fledged werewolf, because he's been with me every night, and I just see him in his human form, except sometimes as we are driving along. I'll see his eyes turn yellow under the deep shadows cast by the moon. Something is clearly different. Did the sample he took from Elijah that night have something to do with it? I feel trapped in this situation. Bill seems something else besides human and I can't abandon my post without making him suspicious. I also don't want to abandon my post because I feel like I have a duty to the visitors here to keep this werewolf at bay. And I do agree with Sarah, given the circumstances, I don't feel comfortable ending the life of a fellow park ranger. Bill's a relative newcomer, and I worked with Elijah for years before he disappeared. I don't want to give up on a fellow ranger. To be continued. I walk at night in my rural area regularly. I've encountered black bears, coyotes, bobcats, angry deer, and everything on down with no real concern. But the creepiest encounter was a little black pickup truck with rainbow and unicorn stickers, bubblegum pop music blaring, and it smelled like cotton candy when it passed me. First time it passed me, it swerved to hit me. I jumped out of the way easily. I thought nothing of it really, just figured they were startled by seeing me at night with my reflective gear. The truck circled back and comes at me again. I saw it coming this time and grabbed my dog up just in time to jump into a ditch. I heard little girl laughter, high-pitched and maniacal. The tiny truck circled back for a third go at me, but by then I was hiding in my neighbor's shrubbery. I watched it slowly drive down the road, hearing giggling as it passed me. Fortunately, it kept on going, and I made it home just fine. The incident took place in November 2012. The gas station was a lonely building just off the highway, and was the only service station for miles around. It was around 3 a.m., and the attendant was going about his normal duties when the power suddenly went out, plunging him into darkness. Using his phone as a makeshift light, the attendant made his way back to the backup gas generator and switched it on. The backup lighting came on, but only the parking lot and the hall to the register were lit up. The rest of the gas station remained in darkness. The attendant figured that the bad weather was probably to blame for the power outage. That was until he saw something moving at the edge of the darkness. He watched intently for several moments eventually making out what looked to be three children riding bikes. Almost as soon as he saw them, 
Two leaped from their bikes and made their way over to the gas station. They stopped at the doorway and stood staring at the attendant. Now a little unsettled but still not overly concerned, he made his way to the door and opened it, asking the two children if they were okay and stating it was late for such young kids to be roaming around near the highway. One of them, a young girl, asked him if she could use his phone. As he handed her his mobile phone, her eyes met him, and the attendant saw that they were solid black orbs. No, the girl snapped, I need the real one, motioning to use the landline phone in the gas station itself. At this point, fear finally overtook the attendant and he pushed the door shut and locked it in one move, shouting as he did so that the girl should go home. The children stared at the attendant through the window for a moment longer before turning around, getting on their bikes and riding off into the darkness. The following morning, the attendant told his boss of the ordeal and requested that he go through the security cameras. However, they had been off due to the power outage. It is not known if the power going out was connected to the black-eyed kid's arrival, or if it was just an unusual coincidence. I lived in Lac du Flambeau, Wisconsin in August 1994. Seven of us were joyriding in my dad's car and I was driving. It was about 10 p.m. on a summer night. We came up to a stop sign and noticed that there were what we thought were kids playing on the swing sets at the grade school which was about half a block away. I pulled up at the school and whoever it was, was gone. I pulled up into the horseshoe drive all the way, and that's when we saw it. Hovering above the tree line, I could see the outline and the color was white. There were two white lights at each end of the wing tips. Everybody started to scream and holler, go, go, go. And then the third light lit up, kind of. It opened almost like an eye pupil, like dilating. The light was an orange color. I floored the gas pedal and we spun out of there quick. I didn't hear it make any noise because we had a little boom box in the car. We were listening to Metallica and the song Green Hell was playing. Plus everybody screaming and crying. We went to my friend's house and she told her dad about it. He grabbed a flashlight and we went back. He went into the woods and found nothing. He went home and we all went to a local pizza place told other friends about it, and drew pictures of what we saw. We all saw the same thing. It was getting late and the pizza place was closing. So I went to go start the car, and it was making a horrible noise. Like if you were to keep turning the ignition when the car was already running. Everybody took off running like it was going to explode. My friend's brother opened the hood and unhooked the battery. Had to leave the car there and walk home. I have never been so terrified walking home alone. When I got home, my dad wasn't home, but my mom was. I told her about it, and she didn't say anything. I heard my dad come in later that night, and he was angry, telling me I better go get his car. My mom told him that we had seen something, and he didn't believe any of it. I couldn't sleep all that night. In the next few days, I heard that there were other sightings. Not in the same place, but within a few mile radius. I guess that I should add that the school was on a lakefront, and that one of the other sightings was above a lake. I didn't have the best relationship with my uncle. It hadn't always been like this, though. I remember my childhood and how we'd spend a lot of time together. Sometime after I turned six, though, he suddenly went dark and his visits nearly ended completely. He used to come around about once every two months, and then out of the blue, I was lucky to see him once every ten years. He had nearly become a distant memory when I received a phone call from him asking for me to visit him. I was going to say no, but he then dropped the bombshell that he was dying. Years of smoking had caught up to him, and he didn't have much time left. He even offered to pay for my flight. My uncle lived on a ranch far removed from other people. I think his closest neighbors lived about 20 miles away from his patch of land. He seemed to enjoy it this way and I had wondered about it before. I would soon find out why. I knocked on the door and it opened to reveal the smiling face of my uncle. 
He was far removed from the memories I had of him, just barely recognizable, but that's what 10 years in cancer do to a person, I suppose. He invited me to sit down and we exchanged a few pleasantries and general chit-chat. My uncle had brought out some snacks which I had enjoyed as a child. I honestly didn't like them as much now that I was older, but I didn't want to say that and just thanked him. It was after an hour that he got to the meat of the matter. Now, nephew, he said. He actually used my name while talking, but I don't want to reveal it so I'll just replace it with nephew for the sake of this and I'll address him as simply uncle. Are you still big on the whole saving the rainforest thing, oh right? Um, yeah, I still want to help protect the environment. I've started a project to help save a type of frog within South America, and there's this big, my uncle raised up a hand. Sorry, I would love to hear all about it. I did love your stories back when you were little you had such a vivid imagination. Honestly though, I never thought that you'd actually embark on a journey to become a real environmentalist, but I'm glad you did. Nephew, I don't have a lot of time left, and so I want to get straight to the point. He took a deep breath. Do you believe in monsters? Monsters, I asked, confused. Yes, my uncle said. Monsters. They exist. You might not believe in them now, but you will once this is over. I don't understand, I said. Let me ask you another question. Do you believe that every species on Earth has a right to be protected, he asked. Well, yeah, I said. And if you had the power to save one of them, would you? Why, yeah, I would, I said. My uncle relaxed a little. He then got up to get his rifle. Do you know how to use one of these? Yeah, Dad taught me, but I've never actually used one of them in a dangerous situation before, I professed. You probably won't need it, but take it anyway, he said. I'll explain what this is about, but I need you to come with me somewhere. We then spent 15 minutes hauling supplies to the back of his truck. All in all, it was probably enough to last someone several months, and I was honestly confused as to why my uncle would need that much. While he drove me to our destination, he started talking again. Do you believe in Bigfoot? Sasquatches? He asked. Bigfoot? I said and laughed. The town where I grew up had had a Bigfoot sighting ten years ago. It wasn't all too famous outside of it, though, and I doubt anyone outside of our town has even heard of it. Well, you see, when you think of stories of ape men or the like, my uncle continued. You'll know that the Native Americans also had similar stories of seeing such creatures. That seems to tell me that they probably are real, but that leads to another question, of course. Why haven't we ever found one? It's said that at one point, the population of humans on Earth was only 10,000, but we bounced back from that. If we assume that there are even one-tenth that amount of them around, only a thousand, we should still have found traces of them. Dead bodies. Excreta. There should be videos of them migrating for food. But there aren't any and all you can find is very bad grainy footage occasionally. So they're not real then, I said with a shrug. My uncle shook his head. There's an easy answer to that paradox. The reason we haven't found them was that they were hunted to near extinction by people like me. I was waiting for the laugh indicating that this was a joke, but it never came. It was after my stint in the army I was looking for work, and I was an experienced hunter to boot, and so some suits from the feds came round to try and recruit me. They said that I had to hunt a kind of ape, and I needed the cash at the time, so I agreed, my uncle said. I never really found out why it was that the government wanted them gone, my uncle said. Some of the other hunters had their theories. Some said we were harvesting their organs. Others said that we were going to clone them to make super soldiers. Some people thought that the Bigfoot was actually more advanced than us and would threaten our position as the dominant species on this earth. I have a far simpler theory we hunted them because we wanted their land. Bigfoot tends to be rather docile most of the time, but they are also very territorial. Some people must have died at one point because of them while encroaching on their land, and the government realized that we had to wipe them all out. Of course, this isn't the 1-800s, and if the public got wind of it well, it would be bad so the project was kept hidden. I was pretty good at it, 
my uncle said. I had a total of 339 confirmed kills. I never thought anything of it at first. I just thought I was hunting any other kind of animal. Until one day, I was all alone tracking two of these creatures when one of them almost got the jump on me. I managed to kill it with a lucky shot, thank the gods or else I wouldn't be here today. The other one ran away and I went after it. I was able to finish it off 20 minutes later and I followed some of its older tracks to a small enclave in the woods. His hands began to shake a little and I offered to drive. No, it's fine. I had never seen a child before then. A child Bigfoot, that is to see. Well, a baby animal was still an animal after all, so I raised my gun when it did something none of them had done before. It spoke. I had heard roars and growls before, but never actual words. Two syllables. Mama. It said them again and something else and began wailing. The way it said that it kind of reminded me of you, nephew. He smiled fondly. I know you can't remember, but I remember holding you in my arms while you spoke your first words. You were so adorable back then. His smile vanished. It was then that what I was doing hit me. I wasn't saving humanity from some rabid animals, I was wiping out another species which was maybe as smart or even smarter than us, my uncle said. I never mentioned what happened to anyone else, but I quit sometime later. I'm sorry I wasn't around more while you were growing up, I secluded myself here. I had two, he said, and then stopped. We had arrived at a small clearing. He handed me the rifle and got off the truck. There's something I haven't told you. There was a reason some of us thought that the Bigfoot was superior to us. They have a special skill, so to speak. At first, we thought they had some kind of telepathy. But no, they're able to communicate with a special type of sound wave that travels for hundreds of miles. It's at a frequency humans can't hear, but once we used special equipment, we were able to detect it. That's why it's so hard to find them once you encounter one that one will contact every single other one in a hundred mile radius and tell them to run. My uncle pulled out a strange flute. You know what a dog whistle is, right? This is kind of the same thing. Up till then, it had occurred to me that this might have been some sort of elaborate joke. My uncle wasn't really a prankster, but maybe he had wanted to make me laugh one last time or something. That or maybe the medications were interfering with his reasoning ability. He played something on the flute, and nothing happened for ten minutes, even though my neck kept turning at the slightest sound made by the forest. Every twig snapping or bird chirping nearly made me jump as the suspense dialed up to a crescendo when I finally told myself to relax and take a deep breath. And then I knew that my uncle was perfectly sane and hadn't been telling me some weird story. Out of the corner of my eyes, I saw a dark figure emerge. Now you've probably seen some footage or drawings of Bigfoot. I'll say that many of them are reasonably accurate. You're looking at something about eight feet tall, which is very ape-like. That is to say, except for the face. That face was surprisingly human, and it made me wonder how it was that my uncle kept killing them without a bit of remorse for so many years. It had a strange way of walking and paused after taking two steps. It pointed a finger at me. Who is he? The words were deeper than any other voice I'd heard and a little garbled, but the meaning was clear enough. He's my nephew, my uncle said. He then pointed to his truck. I got you all I need, but I'm dying. I won't be around for long. He then turned to me. I, I hope he'll keep taking care of you, but my time here is up. He began to cry, something I'd never thought he'd do. If you want to kill me, you can do it now. A chill went down my spine. I was the one who killed your parents. I think you know that my uncle continued. You might as well take me out of my misery now. The thing raised a hairy fist and I raised the rifle reflexively, but my uncle put up a hand to stop me. This is what I want. I hesitated, and that was a fatal mistake. Even if I wanted to, there was no way I would have reacted in time to save my uncle. But no killing blow came. Instead, the thing pointed a finger at my uncle and said, Mama. Tears flowed down my uncle's face like a faucet. 
After all this time, I helped my uncle who was sobbing, so it was really me doing all the work, unload the supplies, and we drove off. What was that about? I asked him angrily. Were you really going to let it kill you? It's a he, my uncle corrected, and I have done so much wrong, nephew, throughout my life. Raising him was just a partial atonement for my sins. I know it isn't enough. I can't even walk into a church and confess my sins to anyone. He then paused. I am sorry, though. I didn't want to drag you into this, but someone needs to keep supplying him with food. I keep him hidden, but if he goes out to forage for food, he'll be found someday, and this place isn't big enough for him to live off the land. Why this rifle, then? I asked. Because, my uncle said, I was worried that he might try to kill you as revenge instead of me. After all, I killed some of his family. He might have considered that to be fair. But I wouldn't let him hurt you. Of course, I was completely wrong. I was thinking about what I would have done. But he isn't like me. He's much better and bigger of a person than I am. It was then that I realized what my uncle had been talking about earlier. The monsters he spoke of. He wasn't talking about the Bigfoot I had just seen. He was talking about humans. Part of it must have been about himself. Most of it must have been about the other people who had organized the hunt for these creatures, who still walked the earth freely with no guilt in their souls. So what do I have to do? I asked. My uncle's eyes lit up a bit. Will you do it? Will you take care of him for me? My uncle said that he would leave his investments totaling $12 million hunting Bigfoot apparently paid very well as well as the ranch. It would be more than enough for me to keep the place running. I could even hire some helpers to work on the ranch, though he advised against it as some of them might talk. My uncle died three months later. I was with him when he passed away as he couldn't confess his darkest sin to the pastor he confessed it to me instead. For the last four years, I've been running this place mostly smoothly. Something strange did happen the last time I went to supply him. Behind him, I saw two shadows. One was a bit shorter than him, and one was even shorter than me. It appeared that he had found himself a partner, and even a child. Where had they come from? Most likely he had signaled to her using the special call he had. The two of us didn't talk too much, but I did tell him I was happy for him. He smiled back and said, Thank you, brother. For many of you who enjoy hunting for Bigfoots, not in the sense that my uncle did, of course, I just mean people who like searching for signs of Bigfoot. I have a message to pass on to you all. Don't bother, you'll never find them. They know to hide from humans. Many if not all of the sightings you hear about are just hoaxes. I even have the suspicion that many of the hoaxes are done by the government to discredit true sightings. But I know that I can't solve this problem alone. If people don't know what's happening, the few remaining ones will be killed. And I can't save a species like this. I need to get the word out to let the public know what the government's been doing behind your back. And we can't let them continue. I have devoted lots of time to saving these creatures, but I can't do it by myself. Already, I know many of you will dismiss this as a tall tale. But for those of you who do believe, remember, the best thing you can do for these creatures is simple. Leave them alone. In case you do find one or think you saw one in the area, maybe you could leave something to eat for them, but it's doubtful that they'll come back to that area. After all, even I wouldn't trust humans after what they've gone through. I ventured deep into the heart of the secluded Idaho forest on a solo hunt, determined to track down elusive stags that had long eluded my grasp. The dense woods were shrouded in a cloak of shadows, the sunlight struggling to pierce through the thick canopy above. The scent of damp earth and pine needles filled the air, a familiar and comforting presence that grounded me amidst the solitude. As I followed the path deeper into the woods, my senses sharpened, attuned to the rustling leaves and the subtle shifts in the wind. The anticipation of the hunt surged through my veins, mingling with a quiet reverence for the untamed beauty that surrounded me. Each step was deliberate, each sound carefully weighed against the backdrop of nature's symphony. 
And then, as if emerging from the depths of the forest itself, I saw it a figure unlike anything I had encountered before. It stood tall and imposing, walking upright in my direction. My heart quickened, and I instinctively sought cover behind a nearby tree, my breathing shallow as I peered out. I turned to cast a cautious glance in its direction, my pulse pounding in my ears. The creature was closer now, just about ten feet away. Its form was shrouded in darkness, an enigmatic silhouette that defied easy description. Its build was sturdy, slightly shorter than my own, and it moved with an unsettling grace that sent shivers down my spine. I strained my eyes to discern its features, but its necklace head remained obscured, devoid of any visible features that I could make out. It paused by the very tree I was using for cover, its head tilting upward as it sniffed the air, like a predator catching a scent on the breeze. The absence of visible eyes only heightened the eerie sensation that gripped me. Fear rooted me to the spot, my muscles refusing to obey my desperate pleas to flee. I watched, transfixed, as the creature's attention shifted away from me. With a casual nonchalance that sent a shiver down my spine, it turned and walked away, fading into the forest like a specter melting into the shadows. In a surge of both desperation and disbelief, I raised my rifle and aimed it at the retreating figure. The gunshot shattered the silence, the sharp report echoing through the woods. I watched as the bullet streaked toward the creature, impacting its dark form. But to my shock, the bullet seemed to bounce off its skin, falling harmlessly to the ground. The creature didn't flinch, didn't react. It was as if its very flesh was impervious to harm. A sense of bewilderment washed over me as the creature disappeared from sight. My thoughts were a jumble of confusion and wonder, grappling with the inexplicable encounter that had just unfolded before me. Slowly, I lowered my rifle, my hands trembling as I tried to make sense of what I had witnessed. Hours later, as I returned home to the waiting embrace of my wife, I found myself at a loss for words. Her eyes sparkled with curiosity and warmth, and she asked the question that I had anticipated, did you hunt anything today? But I remained silent, the memory of the enigmatic creature still vivid in my mind. I had ventured into the heart of the forest, seeking to conquer nature and claim my prize. Instead, I had come face to face with a mystery beyond my understanding, a reminder that the wild places of the world held secrets far stranger and more wondrous than I could ever have imagined. My story is short and takes place many years ago when I was a kid in the early 1980s living in southeast Missouri. My parents and the neighbors were hanging out having a few Miller lights in the neighbor's yard and we kids were playing. It was shortly after dark when we decided to play tag. For those of us that have actually gone outside to play in the suburbs, know that this is a perfect time to play this game. My neighborhood was like most, I guess. But my neighborhood was near a creek that ran for miles and passed by several thick stands of trees. So we'd been playing a while when I ran away from whomever it was that was it. It was at that moment when I saw something, a huge, almost glowing white shape, walking between two trees in the yard in front of me. It looked like a mixture of the Patterson, Gimlin Bigfoot, and one of those costumed villains from Scooby-Doo. It quickly passed behind a tree and was gone. It didn't reappear on the other side. I was so shocked and terrified that I couldn't take my eyes off where it had been. Then I ran straight into another tree, knocking myself silly. After the excitement of me hurting myself was over, I told my brother about it, and he, like everyone else I've told since, thought the same thing, that I had imagined it due to nearly knocking myself out. But I know what I saw, and that I saw it before I hit the tree, and to this day, I can still see it in my mind as clearly as I did that late summer evening. I've gone on to call whatever I saw Bigfoot's ghost. I wanted to report something that happened to my daughter and two of her friends back in 1989. My daughter Roxanne had taken a trip with her school friend Kimberly and Kim's brother Keith down to Ocala. Florida to stay at Kim's grandmother's house for the weekend. Kim's grandparents had a home deep in the woods down a long dirt road. 
We're still trying to figure out approximately where they live since my daughter was only 11 years old when this happened and kids pay little attention to details at that age. The three of them had taken their bicycles and were riding them down the road in the forest. The road was typical Florida sugar sand, which makes riding not as easy as a hard road. Suddenly, a huge animal walked out of the woods about 40 yards in front of them. They all stopped as the massive creature walked across the road from the animal. According to my daughter, they recognized it immediately as a Bigfoot. It was looking directly at them as it crossed. She said it never expressed any kind of emotion on his face and showed zero concern about them seeing it. On the other hand, the kids were terrified. She described the creature as being massive and at least seven feet tall, but maybe more. She also said it definitely was not an ape, but the face was human-like and covered with hair. Furthermore, she said it had huge hands. It could have probably covered their whole heads with one hand. She said she did not see any claws, just long fingers. The head appeared slightly domed and the color she described as being like a sun-bleached brown, basically brown with reddish highlights, but not orangish like an orangutan. They did not see anything that indicated gender. The face was more flat as opposed to having a snout or a muzzle like a bear. As soon as the Bigfoot entered the woods on the other side of the road, they turned their bikes around and bolted for the house. They described their escape as terrifying in the soft sand that impeded their speed. She said that as tall and built as the creature was, there would have been no way to outrun it if it had pursued them. As soon as they got to the grandparents' house, they all ran inside exclaiming that they had just seen a Bigfoot. The grandmother was in the kitchen baking a cake and blew it off saying they probably saw a monkey since there were occasional monkey sightings in the area. Some places like Silver Springs, Florida, not far from Ocala, have large populations of monkeys from the days back when Tarzan movies were filmed there. I recently spoke with my daughter about the experience she insisted that it was not a monkey or a bear, and that the animal just appeared too human-like to be an ape of some kind. She said it walked on two legs just like a human does. She says it bothers her this very day, and that she could not rationally explain what the three of them saw that day but they saw it clearly in the middle of a bright, hot, sunny day. The year was 1990. Desert Storm and Nelson Mandela being freed from prison. I and three friends, while serving in the British Army, traveled to Brighton, England for a few days of R&R &R holiday. The weather was particularly hot that year. We were wasting no time enjoying it. My friend Andy and I decided to go for a walk along Brighton Pier, famous for its amusement arcade and ice cream. Whilst there we got to speak to two young German girls from Nuremberg, and we hit it off immediately. They spoke broken English, and we tried our best WW2 movie German Commandant accents with them. For the next few hours we all laughed and joked about everything with each other, and the language barrier became less of a distraction as the evening wore on. One girl was a blonde and the other a redhead, both beautiful and way out of our league, and yet they liked us and wanted to know more about us. As we were both in the awkward teenage years, myself and Andy didn't know which girl liked who and I was just glad to get some attention from the opposite sex. After a while, we all decided to meet again at the same time and place the next day. They left the pier to join friends while we waited for our other two friends to join us. The following evening, filled with nerves and apprehension, I and Andy made our way to the pier. Standing at the entrance were these two beautiful German girls all dressed up in tight dresses waiting for us. I couldn't believe my luck. We all walked to the pier and got some food before deciding we should all go to the cinema to see Bird on a Wire starring Mel Gibson. I and Andy looked at each other, knowing that this would be the ideal place to find out which girl liked who. We made our way to the pier exit, but at this point, for the strangest reason ever, Andy walked ahead of all of us and ran across the large open road in front of us. I called him back, but he continued to run toward the other side. Knowing that he was heading in the wrong direction to the cinema, I apologized to the girls and asked them to stay where they were so I could return my idiotic friend. 
I ran over to the other side, approximately 20 meters in width where he was standing at. I grabbed him and said, what are you doing? The cinema is this way. He could not provide any reason or rationale for his behavior. At this point, we both quickly headed back to the other side of the road, but to our bemusement, the girls were nowhere to be seen. This is less than 10 to 15 seconds since I spoke to them. Now if you could picture the scene at Brighton Pier. It's a long, wide open road that stretches out a long distance and would require some amount of running for the girls to hide, especially running in the dresses that they were wearing. We looked everywhere for the next few hours, searching the pier pretty extensively, but to no avail and eventually giving up and being annoyed with Andy. The next day at the same time, we came back to the pier to seek out the girls, but they never showed up. The next day we had to leave to go elsewhere and never got the chance to speak to those two German girls from Nuremberg. Andy and I lost touch not long after that, but caught up 25 years later. After a few war stories and some alcohol, the topic of Brighton came up. We discussed what happened that night. Maybe after all this time, Andy would have a different view of the story that I had on it. But he didn't, and to this day he still felt as I did about it spooked. We both discussed, where did they go and what happened? Why did Andy walk away without reason? How could we not see them run away if that is what they decided to do? So many more unanswered questions. To this day, I don't know if those two girls from Germany are alive, dead, or just part of our imagination. Or was it something more paranormal? I'm Chris, a park ranger, and have 11 years on my belt. Also experience comes with stories, many of which are ghost or paranormal stories. This story is true. Not going to say where I work, but it is a very large park. This story took place spring of 2008. The park that I worked at had a very big drinking problem with youths trespassing all the time. We had calls almost every night I worked nights most of my career. One day a member of the public who were camping had called in saying that there were a large group of youths making noise and drinking. I was dispatched and starting walking over in the dark. I tried to sneak up this was a breach of my standard operating procedure to try to apprehend as many as I can I managed to apprehend four or five don't clearly remember and all the others ran into the woods my prediction was that were as many as 20 people from what I saw. I radioed through to dispatch to get a couple of deputies out here to take over. Deputies arrived at this point, I was all alone in the middle of nowhere I radioed through to try to get guided back to the more civilized part of the woods at this point. I had already walked quite far and radio connection was breaking up we had bad radios back. Then as I approached a part of the woods I was similar with I looked behind me and saw someone walking up to me very slowly. I then called out, hello. No response at this point radio contact was back I radioed in saying that I have spotted someone. At this point the figure is maybe 40 meters away I then called out stop and are you okay no response. As the figure came closer it just disappeared I couldn't make out what it was. Next day came a normal day mentioned to my friend who had worked here for 10 years. I mentioned what happened and he made a scared face and said it's nothing got up and walked away. In 2013, I left to work at the sheriff's office, never mentioned to anyone except some close friends while drunk. This might not be the scariest story, but I have only had a couple of other ghost stories might put them on here later on. But this send shivers down my spine as it is still unexplained, which makes the story even scarier. But I hope this interested some of you guys. I will submit more in the future. I have tried to contact some people that have worked in similar settings to see if they have similar experience, and by the looks of it, not many people have had similar experience, except some guys in search and rescue and border patrol. Also I have read some stories of stuff like this in the UK. I might update if I have seen a similar story. I'm a park ranger named John and was driving down a remote road deep within the forest. I reached a point where the Mullicker River ran parallel to the road. 
Up ahead, my headlights illuminated a large, dark figure emerging from the woods and making its way onto the roadway. Approaching cautiously, I saw the figure step right in front of my car, blocking my path. I had to bring my vehicle to a sudden halt to avoid hitting this enigmatic creature. The creature before me was something out of the ordinary. It stood well over six feet tall, its body covered in wet, matted black fur. Strangely, it appeared to lack forelegs but boasted a pair of massive, powerful hind legs. As I sat there, the creature's two piercing red eyes locked onto me through the car's windshield. It lingered for a few tense moments before abruptly turning and continuing its journey across the road, walking upright with a peculiar, almost robotic-like gait, eerily reminiscent of a human. Was this a dogman? I am describing my first experience that I can remember here. I believe I was 15 years old. I had gone to bed that Saturday night probably between the hours of 10 and 11 p.m. I lived in Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. My bedroom was on the top floor of our house in a turret. There was a single bed on either side of the room which was in the shape of an octagon. I woke with a start and looked over at the other bed and saw my cat sleeping there. He always did. I then looked at the clock radio which had been acting strangely over the past few weeks. It had been turning itself on and off all by itself, usually around the same time at night. Perhaps I had gotten so used to it that's why I had woken, but the time on it said it was 12.15 a.m. I tried to roll over and go back to sleep. Suddenly I found myself paralyzed on my back, unable to move. There was a tall being beside me to the left. The right side of my bed was up against the wall. This being was also a shadow, but its eyes glowed white. It began to communicate with me via ESP. I was somehow able to communicate back with it the same way. I do not remember everything. I do remember it asking me if I wanted to join it on its ship. Then suddenly the craft appeared by the window in green, greenish blue and violet lights were flashing from a silver disc like UFO that was being operated by others that were in the room with me. It hovered there for several minutes. During this period of time, the shadowy being took what was to me, its index finger, and touched me on my solar plexus. I then woke in a start. My cat was not on the other bed and the clock radio said it was only midnight. I thought I had experienced a bad dream. The following morning I went to get into the shower and on my solar plexus was a marking. It remained there for a number of years and was very sensitive. It comes and goes now. When that spot on me is touched I feel as if endorphins are being released. I have had other experiences since this one such as sightings of strange things in the sky and being paralyzed in bed. Seeing strange lights flash and shadows. However, none were quite like this. I also had some inorganic materials exit my body only several months ago, which I am not comfortable showing to a doctor. Man, I am so shy to share because it really seems far-fetched. It was towards Christmas time important later and my spouse and I were hanging out at home. I looked up still in the house and saw him standing there. He looked just like the stereotypical garden gnome, red cap, beard and all. My memory is that his eyes got a little wide when he saw me looking, and he gave me what seemed like a jaunty little wave and a smile. Anyway, I turned to get my spouse's attention to see if he could see it too, and when I looked back he disappeared. I searched the whole house trying to prove to myself that I didn't imagine it. My spouse, being Norwegian, believes it was a tauntiness which is why I mention it being Christmas time. I've questioned myself thousands of times since, but I wasn't asleep, impaired in any way or have a tendency to hallucinate. One reason we might have attracted one, if it was real, is that we've always left a plate out for any creatures on New Year's Eve, typically a sweet, a little pickled herring and a drink of some sort, just to be friendly. I usually leave out a needle and thread as well so they could repair their clothes. In the morning, I take the remains outside for scavengers. I kind of saw it as a harmless little tradition that my husband's family does. 
but I'm a little more deliberate about not forgetting to leave it out these days. So, that's my story. I'm not convinced that it's logical in any way, but I do like the idea of there being a little magic left in this world. True story. This happened about 20 years ago, and it still gives me the willies I had invited a few friends over one night after work for a couple of beers, and we were just hanging out vibing and jiving some philosophy around the coffee table in the living room. I was somewhat absent-mindedly spinning a quarter 25 cent piece as the conversation progressed. I proposed an interesting question to my friends. How many sides does a coin have? A coin has two sides, of course, was the first response. Actually, that is incorrect, I retorted. Then I stopped the coin from spinning and flicked it one more time to let it spin again as I explained. A coin has three sides, the front, back, and the thinnest side being the edge or thickness of the coin. As I explained this, we all watched the coin slow down, and gradually it stopped spinning, only for it to stop perfectly balanced on its edge. The third side. We were all totally dumbstruck. It seemed too impossible to all be a coincidence. I have tried to make this happen again ever since, and I've never been successful. What do you guys think? We stayed at Lake George Battlefield Campground. Our last night camping was Sunday, July 16, this year, 2023. Right after midnight, my friends went to use the bathroom and left me alone by the fire when I heard a woman's voice singing in the woods. It was spooky, but also dreamlike. I describe it as singing because it sounded so practiced, but it was arpeggiated notes, no words. Would also describe it as sad and possibly ritualistic. Startled, I tried to record it because it was definitely audible. Figured if my ears can pick it up, so can a mic. No chance. I responded with vocals of my own and then asking who was there. No response. My friends returned about 10 minutes later and the singing stopped as I heard their footsteps approaching from the road. They told me it was bullfrogs. The pitch changes and length of the notes was no way a bullfrog forest animal. For reference, the campsite we stayed was 200 feet south of the Isak Jogs Monument. There is a nature trail about 400 feet west, down the hill from our site. In front of the nature trail is the Tiki Hotel. We can see those lights through the foliage. I'm really thinking it was a someone practicing some Native American ritual. We've stayed at the same campsite every year for the past five, but this is our first time staying into Monday morning. Would anybody know what goes on out there on Sundays? Hiking in Virginia two days in and 20 plus miles from anything. In the middle of the night, while we were sitting around the campfire, we hear a major commotion coming down the ridge above our trail. Out of nowhere, some guy hauls ass by our sight, wearing a jogging suit and small kid-sized backpack. Two minutes later, two other guys come down the hill from the same place, no trail, both leading German Shepherd and dressed in FBI-type clothing. I'm thinking we were close to some hillbilly pot fields. Also, the brown mountain lights in NC are pretty odd. Years ago, around a decade back, my friend and I were part of the same Marine Corps Reserve Unit. The distance to our unit from my place was a good two hours. One particular day, we were required to report early. To save time, we decided I'd stay at his place, situated halfway between my home and the drill center. After a night of barracks cuts and a couple of beers, my friend, looking a bit troubled, confided in me about an unusual problem with the house he was renting. He believed it was haunted by a ghost. I, being a skeptic, couldn't help but tease him. But his response was not what I expected. He looked straight into my eyes and uttered, It's a damn cat. He recounted incidents where he'd wake up to see the cat lounging outside his bedroom. Each time he would leap out of bed to catch it, but by the time he'd reached the doorway just five, seven feet away, it would vanish. 
I laughed it off, attributing it to his imagination, and decided to crash on the living room couch. The stillness of the night was interrupted when I felt something brushing against my hand, which dangled off the couch. As I peered down, I was met with the sight of a cat affectionately rubbing its head against my hand. Panic set in as I realized I was paralyzed the dreaded sleep paralysis. While my body was immobile, my willpower drove me to make a tiny movement. In a desperate attempt to prove its existence, I managed to grip the cat's face with my index finger, trying to nick my finger on its sharp tooth. Suddenly, the cat wrenched free and darted straight through the living room wall. The moment its tail disappeared, the paralysis lifted. Frantically, I inspected my finger. While there was no visible injury, I could faintly feel where the tooth had pressed against it, and there seemed to be a slight discoloration. The next day, still bewildered, I narrated the previous night's events to my friend. I may never know the truth of that night, but part of me is convinced I held on to a ghostly feline, even if just for a fleeting moment. The most uncanny thing, it behaved just like any ordinary cat. I've been a biologist ever since I was 22 years old. I grew up on a farm in rural Illinois, so nature has never been a stranger to me. Playing in the woods was how I entertained myself growing up. Spending all my time in a forest as a child, people expect me to have stories about Bigfoot or strange noises or finding some weird shrine out in the middle of the woods, but no. The weirdest thing I ever encountered was a bobcat screeching. It sounds just like a woman's dying scream, and yes, to everyone who's ever claimed to hear a skinwalker or goatman screeching in the woods at night, I promise you, it was just a bobcat. The truth is often mundane and disappointing. You'd think this would mean I'd have gotten bored of the woods, but I never really lost my love for them. Nature is boring. That's why I like it. You know what to expect. That's why, after college, I decided to make studying nature my full-time career. I'm a biologist for the Sierra Club, specialized in the ecosystems of Midwestern America. Fish, birds, deer, elk, bear, wolves, the like. I've spent weeks in fire towers, cabins, campsites, always miles away from civilization. I'm usually gathering data on local wildlife, measuring for pollutants, determining whether the ecosystem is stable or if anything threatens it. The work is not glamorous, but I enjoy it. And nature had still never surprised me. Until my last assignment. I was designated to be stationed alone in a cabin in the Ozarks. The assignment was supposed to last last three weeks in May. The Sierra Club was alerted to a steady decline in the local elk population over the last decade. Nothing drastic, but enough to raise concern. My job was to take census of the wildlife, measure for pollutants, the usual. These are my diary entries for my assignment, starting with my first night. I arrived in the evening in early May. Nothing was amiss the first two nights. It seemed an assignment like any other. The sounds of the forest were exactly what you'd expect. Crickets, an owl's hoot, and the occasional elk call. I was sent here in May because that's their mating season. The elk are out and about looking for, uh, dates, and that makes them easy to count. Elk mating is pretty straightforward. The female lets out a call and waits for a male to find her. Usually it's first come, first served, if you catch my drift. If only right, it was clear that love was in the air, and for all the calling, you'd think I would start seeing elk. But by the second day, I still hadn't spotted a single one. The third night, I was lying awake in bed uneasy. Something wasn't sitting right with me, but I couldn't put my finger on why. I was about to nod off when a female call cut through the night. I sighed. That was the second time that night I'd heard her. What, are the fellas having a guy's night in or something? And that's when it finally hit me. I shot bolt upright in bed. For the last three nights, I had heard nothing but female mating calls. That should have drawn every male within half a mile. Now elk are not discreet, and they don't beat around the bush. When that male gets to the female. Well, let's just that the whole forest will know about it. 
I sat in bed, staring out into the night, pondering. There have to be males close enough to hear this female. So after three nights of her calls, why haven't I heard the main event? The third day, I went out onto the trails, once again looking for some sign of elk in the forest. What I found was not encouraging. About a quarter mile from my cabin, I was trekking down the trail when I noticed something 30 feet into the woods. A large brown fuzzy mass lying in the brush. I smiled. An elk taking a midday nap. I took out my binoculars to get a closer look. It was an elk, all right. But my smile dropped when I realized that the brown fuzzy mass was completely still. I carry a hunting rifle with me for safety. I readied it and approached the elk carefully. It looked fine from where I was standing, but I nearly dropped my rifle when I rounded to the animal's front. It was carnage. The poor creature had been completely gutted. What little remained of its entrails hung loosely out of its chest cavity. The ribs had been pulled apart, and huge claw marks scarred its flank. Its head was barely connected to its body by a few weak strands of flesh. I heaved and almost lost what little breakfast I'd had. It was horrifying. I had to take a few moments to collect myself. This was the first time that nature had surprised me. What could have possibly done this? I've studied wildlife for years. This was a bull elk in its prime. It would have stood nine feet tall alive, a king of the forest. There is no predator on this continent that could have taken down a full-grown bull, pack or no pack. Even a grizzly wouldn't mess with something this big. And bears are mostly scavengers anyway. My mind raced through possibilities, trying to think of an explanation. Maybe it had been sick. Maybe a predator came upon it in its sleep, took it by surprise. Yes, that must be it. It couldn't have fought back. But this savagery, those claw marks were bigger than even a grizzly's. And its ribs. No quadruped could have exerted leverage on the ribs to split them like that. You would need arms. A chilling thought occurred. A human? Could humans have done this? But why? Hunters would skin it or take the head at least to mount on their wall. Is some psychopath out here dismembering wildlife for fun? And that still wouldn't explain those gruesome claws. Whatever this was, it needed to be reported. I was sent here to investigate the elk population declining, and this had to be related. I fished out my camera to take photos. Having to document the horror from every angle was heart-wrenching. The look in its eyes. This elk had been terrified when it died. I went to take one last shot. Just as the shutter clicked, my ears registered something. A sound from behind me that my camera had nearly drowned out. I whipped around. I had barely heard it, but it was there. A twig snapping. My camera hung from my neck, and my rifle from my shoulder. I dropped the one to snatch up the other. Idiot, I thought to myself as I pointed the rifle towards the sound. I had been so shaken by the sight of the body I had completely overlooked one important fact. The kill was fresh. This corpse hadn't even begun to decay. This elk had been dead no more than half a day, and that means whatever killed it may still be nearby. With my rifle still trained on the spot, I backed away towards the trail. My hike back to the cabin was the only time in my life I felt scared of the forest. Trees surrounding me on all sides, no visibility. I jumped at the slightest sounds, never lowering my rifle, never going more than five seconds without looking behind me. I felt like prey, never knowing where the danger would come from or when. I didn't relax until my cabin door was closed and locked behind me. I spent the rest of my day inside the cabin shaken. I readied the photos and sent them to my supervisors. They would take a day or two to respond. Until then, my plan was to investigate. During the day, and with my rifle ready. That night was my last night at the cabin. I was getting ready for bed when I heard a female elk call again. The first one that I'd heard that day and close, very close. Wildlife don't like buildings. They smell of fire and metal and gasoline, all unnatural to them. They steer clear. What was this elk doing so close to my cabin? I peered out my window into the dark of the forest. No sign of her. 
She must have been beyond the tree line. I grabbed my rifle. Of course, I wasn't going to shoot the elk. But I might send a few shots into the air to scare her off. It would be nice to know the elk are breeding normally, but I could do without front row seats. I unlocked my cabin and took a step out onto my porch, rifle still in hand. My eyes scanned the tree line, looking for the female. That's when a pair of antlers struck out from behind a tree. An elk's head followed them and turned peer right out at me. But this was a buck, probably attracted by the female's calls. This was promising, but all the more reason to scare them away. I raised my rifle to the sky and prepared to fire. That was when the elk flew into the air, or its head did. The buck's head sailed in an arc towards me and landed just feet away from my door. I stood there in shock, trying to process what had just happened. Something. Something or someone had been holding the head, and had just thrown it. I nearly pissed myself in fear. I pointed my rifle at the tree where the buck's head had appeared. The light from my cabin barely reached. Were my eyes playing tricks on me? Had I just seen claws retreat around the trunk? I was frozen. I needed to reach behind me to open my door and get back inside. But I was too scared to turn my back on the forest, or even take a hand off of my rifle. After a few seconds, I finally gathered up the nerve to brace the rifle against my shoulder, my finger still on the trigger. I groped behind me until my left hand found the doorknob, never taking my eyes off the tree. Thank God the door had not locked behind me. With my left hand, I turned the knob and pushed open the door, then drew it back to my rifle. I backed away quickly into the cabin, slamming the door and locking it. I hurried to the windows, drawing all my blinds and making sure each was locked, never letting my rifle out of arm's reach. The terror I felt as I approached each window, never knowing if there would be someone or something on the other side of the glass staring back at me. There hadn't been, which was almost as unnerving. I rushed to the satellite phone to call the sheriff's office at the base of the mountain. The relief I felt when they picked up. You need to get up here, I pleaded. Who is this? It was the sheriff's deputy on the other end. I'd met him and the sheriff before beginning my stay at the cabin. It's me. I'm the guy stationed up at the cabin on the mountain. Oh, sorry about that. What's the problem? There's someone up here messing with me. Get up here now. Whoa, whoa, slow down. You mean like kids or something? No, it is not kids. Someone up here just threw a decapitated elk head at my cabin. In my panic, I'd somehow kept the awareness to use the phrase someone instead of something. I didn't want this guy to think I was drunk or crazy. I just needed him to get up here. Well, what did they look like? How many were there? Did they have guns? I have no idea, man. They killed a god of elk, cut the head off, and threw it at my cabin. Just get the hell up here. Oh shit, okay, okay, lock yourself in there. We're on our way. Man, please stay on the line. I'm scared here. I really was terrified. I wanted someone to stay on the phone with me, even if it couldn't help me. The man replied, I can't get to you and stay on the line at the same time. I'm calling the sheriff now, we're on our way, just lock yourself in and stay there. The man hung up. I swore. I was alone again. A female elk call rang out again. This time it was even closer. It sounded like it was right outside now. I took up my rifle again. That's when the tapping started. While I was talking to the deputy, I hadn't been watching the windows. The sound was coming from the window to the right of my front door. My eyes widened in horror. A single gray claw was tapping on the right edge of the window. Just one claw. Whatever it was attached to wanted to stay out of sight. The claw stopped tapping. Instead, it drew itself along the window and out of my sight, leaving a long, ugly scratch. The sound was horrible, but it didn't stop when it left the window. I could still hear it, dragging along the wooden walls of my cabin. The creature was scratching through solid wood. Could it break through my windows? Why didn't it? My knees shook. I tracked the sound of the scratching with my rifle. My mind raced. Could this thing get in? How long until the sheriff showed up? I was high up on the mountain. 
The drive up here took 45 minutes. Even if they hurried, it might be a half hour. Even if they did get here, could they stop this thing? Should I make a run for my truck? No. Whatever that thing was, it could get to me before I got the truck up and running. Something nagged at the back of my head, but I could barely think. The scratching was louder and louder. Whatever this thing was, it had torn a bull elk to shreds. How could I stop it? The bull. That's when I realized it. The head. It was the same head as the bull I'd seen earlier. It had the same scar down its right cheek. This thing was taunting me. It must have been there when I found the dead elk. It had been watching me, and now it had thrown the head at me. Was it telling me to go away? To get out of its territory? I gasped. With my mind racing, I hadn't noticed that the scratching had stopped. Where was that thing? My eyes darted from window to window. No sign of it. Until the loud thud right above me. It's on the goddamn roof, I thought. Its footsteps echoed through my cabin. Between each step came rhythmic taps, no doubt from its claws. Was it testing for weaknesses? Was it merely toying with me? It had only been a few minutes since I called the sheriff's office. I was still far from safety. I hadn't moved since the call. The thing on my roof thudded from spot to spot. The shock was starting to wear off. Focus. Think. I told myself. The thing had probably seen me through my window. It was right above me. The bathroom. The bathroom was the safest spot. There were no windows. If it does break in, it will have to look for me, then break through the bathroom door. That might buy me an extra minute, and it might save my life. The creature knew where I was. I had to try to change that. I slowly slipped off my shoes. Keeping my rifle trained on the roof, I kicked a shoe towards my bed. Sure enough, the thuds on my roof followed, stopping right above the spot where my shoe had landed. It's tracking me. I slowly shuffled to the bathroom, not raising my feet, afraid to make a sound. Praying that the door would not creak, I opened the bathroom, preparing to lock myself inside. I was shutting myself in, hoping that I wouldn't die in this bathroom, when I heard a loud scratch, followed by a dull thud. It had jumped off the roof. It was on the ground again, outside the cabin. Why? Was it going away? I was afraid to hope that maybe it had gotten bored. Maybe it had found some other prey. That was when I heard the woman scream. I gasped and covered my mouth. How was that possible? No one else is up here. A hiker, a camper maybe. The scream came again. Help, she cried out. I gripped my rifle, crying now. I was frozen in fear. That thing was out there, chasing some poor woman, and I was too cowardly to help her. I just wanted to stay in that bathroom, hiding, hoping that every second the thing spent chasing that woman was another second closer to the sheriff getting here. I don't know how long I sat there, cowering. Another, more desperate scream. Help me. There was something in her terror. She was more scared than I was. And there I sat, letting her die. My shame overcame my fear. I gripped my rifle tighter and left the bathroom. I marched to the door, ready to face whatever this creature was. Maybe I could distract it. Buy time for her to get away. Maybe the sheriff would find her, even if the thing got me first. Just as I was reaching for the doorknob, she cried out again. A pained, dying scream. I was too late. That thing had gotten to her. I was a coward. And because of that, she was dead. The woman moaned in pain, this time just a few meters away from my door. This must be her final moments. And I listened, safe in my cabin. She groaned once more. But this sounded different somehow. It was. My eyes widened in shock and realization. I drew my hand from the doorknob as if it had burned me. I had never unlocked it. Thank God. The moan came again. This time, unmistakable. That was not a moan of pain or terror. It was an entirely different kind of moaning. I backed away from the door. You mother F, I muttered. You almost got me. It all made sense now. There never was any female elk. Mimicry is a common adaptation in all ecosystems, both for prey and for predators. This thing, 
It let out female elk cries to draw in males. And then, well, I had already seen the result in the forest. That's why I never heard the elk mating. There was no female waiting for them. Only this monster. And now it was trying the same tactic on me. I nearly sobbed in terror. It had tried to lure me with the sound of a woman in distress. It thought that might draw me out. When that didn't work, it switched to its tried and true method. A mating call. I aimed my rifle at the door. The moans continued, louder and more intense, building into a climax. I was nauseous at the thought of whatever it was out there, squatting in the dark, mouth agape, emitting this perversion of a woman's voice, trying to draw me out into the dark and rip me apart just like that elk. I stood with my rifle trained at the door, not moving. I had resolved that I was going to stand there until the sun rose or until the sheriff came. And the moment I saw this thing, I was going to shoot it. I don't know how long I stood there among the echoes of that sick creature. Eventually, the moans puttered out, and I was left in silence. Until the tapping began again. In the same spot as before. There it was. That single gray claw, tapping on that same spot where it had scratched the glass. But then a second claw joined it. Then a third. It drummed them along the glass. Slowly ever so slowly. A patch of gray fur poked out from the edge of the window. Time stopped, and the creature brought its face into full view. It was terrible, like a sloth, but its mouth and nose were caked in blood. It had tiny, beady eyes front-facing, a predator's eyes, large, pointed ears almost like a bat, thin, cracked lips. The monster looked right into my eyes. It cocked its head, and then, it pulled those terrible, bloody lips back into a smile. Its razor-sharp teeth, still stained with blood and flesh. I'll never forget them. It pointed that hideous grin at me as it drummed those claws on my window. Shoot, 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 I told myself. But I was frozen. This thing was going to kill me. Light poured through the front window. The monster disappeared out of sight. The sheriff and deputy had arrived in their truck. The two of them sauntered up to my porch and knocked. I had to shake myself out of my stupor and open the door. Both of them backed off and drew their weapons at me, screaming at me to put the gun down. I was still in shock. I think the only thing that kept them from shooting me was the terrified look in my eyes. They asked me what the hell was going on. I could barely speak. I just kept frantically repeating that they needed to get inside, that it was still out there. They eventually told me to come with them down to the sheriff's station. At first, I refused to leave the cabin. They sort of half dragged, half walked me to the truck. They said I was like an owl the whole ride down, my head on a swivel, always scanning the tree line for it. I must have fallen asleep after I got to the station. I woke up the next morning in a cell. I was confused and disoriented. I nearly wept from fear when I finally remembered everything I had been through the night before. The sheriff and deputy sat me down in a room and asked me what the hell happened that night. I was silent at first. I didn't know what to tell them. If I told the truth, they'd think I was crazy. They asked me about the elk's head that I'd told them about during the call. It was gone when they got there, just a bloody stain on the ground where it had been lying. I made up a story, said that some kids were prowling around my cabin, making noises, trying to scare me. I called the sheriff's office because I thought I saw one of them with a gun. The sheriff only made me go over the story once. He seemed satisfied. He took me back up there the next day to collect my stuff. In broad daylight, of course. Sure enough, there were deep scratch marks along the side of the cabin. The sheriff didn't look at me. Kids, he said. We collected my things quickly and hurried back down the mountain. I reported to my supervisors that it was probably overhunting causing the population decline. They would never believe the truth. The sheriff saw me off while I was waiting for the bus to take me back home. He shook my hand and drew me in for one of them manly half hugs. He gripped my shoulder. Don't come back. He whispered. I gave him a confused look. He stared me right in the eyes. It knows you now. Has your scent. 
seen your face, heard your voice. You got away once. It won't happen again, so don't ever come back. That was years ago. I burned the clothes that I had worn that trip, so there's no way they'd end up near the Ozarks again. Never been back anywhere near the Ozarks. And anyone who's ever asked me, I always tell them to steer clear. I've spent so much time trying to forget what I saw that night. But that face, I remember every detail. It's kept me up so many nights with so many questions. What the hell was it? Some freak of nature, a mutant that somehow survived past infancy. Something supernatural. An alien? Those ears. Perfectly crafted to detect minute sounds just like a bat. That explains its mimicry. It grew up in that forest, hearing the elk calls. After a while it learned to copy them. I've spent so many nights asking myself, how? How did it know a woman's voice? I dread to ponder the answer. When sleep finally comes, I have nightmares. Nightmares about campers sitting around their fire, when all of a sudden they hear a voice calling out to them from the woods, crying for help. The voice in my nightmares calling them into the darkness of the trees, away from the safety of their fire. The voice, my voice. One day last week a marvelous apparition was seen near Kenai Island. At the height of at least a thousand feet in the air, a strange object was in the act of flying toward the New Jersey coast. It was apparently a man with bat's wings and improved frog's legs. The face of the man could be distinctly seen, and it wore a cruel and determined expression. The movements made by the object closely resembled those of a frog in the act of swimming with his hind legs and flying with his front legs. Of course, no respectable frog has ever been known to conduct himself in precisely that way. But were a frog to wear bat's wings, and to attempt to swim and fly at the same time, he would correctly imitate the conduct of the Kenai Island monster. When we add that this monster waved his wings in answer to the whistle of a locomotive, and was of a deep black color, the alarming nature of the apparition can be imagined. The object was seen by many reputable persons, and they all agree that it was a man engaged in flying toward New Jersey. About a month ago, an object of precisely the same nature was seen in the air over St. Louis by a number of citizens who happen to be sober and are believed to be trustworthy. A little later, it was seen by various Kentucky persons as it flew across the state. In no instance has it been known to alight, and no one has seen it at a lower elevation than a thousand feet above the surface of the earth. It is without a doubt the most extraordinary and wonderful object that has ever been seen, and there should be no time lost in ascertaining its precise nature, habits, and probable mission. That this aerial apparition is a man fitted with practicable wings, there is no reason to doubt. Someone has solved the problem of aerial navigation by inventing wings with which a man can sustain himself in the air and direct his flight to any desired point. Who is this adventurous flyer and what is his object? Are questions of immediate and enormous importance. Of course, the first impulse of the unreflecting mind will be to exclaim that the mysterious flyer is an aeronaut who has invented practicable wings and is secretly experimenting with them before making his invention public. This is directly at variance with the known habits and customs of aeronauts. Had any aeronaut invented a pair of wings he would have advertised, long before his invention was perfected, that he was in possession of a machine wherewith to make an aerial voyage to Europe in 24 hours, and that he was prepared to exhibit it for a few weeks to everyone who would pay 50 cents to see it. A little later, he would have taken up a subscription to pay the expenses of his proposed voyage in the interests of science, and would probably have published a book on the science of aeronautics. Then he would have suddenly disappeared, taking his wings with him or accidentally burning them, and after the first outburst of indignation on the part of a swindled public, would have been totally forgotten. This has been the invariable practice of these ingenious aeronauts who have claimed to be the inventors of balloons or other apparatus capable of navigating the air. That the mysterious flying man has not followed this custom makes it perfectly clear that he is not a professional aeronaut. 
Beyond any question, either the flying man or some scientific person at present unknown has invented the bat's wings and frog's legs with which the flying man now sails through the air. Why has not the inventor patented his invention and had himself duly written up by the press? The reason is obvious. The flying man is engaged in some undertaking which he cannot safely proclaim. In other words, he is an aerial criminal, a fact which explains the cruelty and determination visible on his countenance. And what can be the nefarious object which this probable wretch has in view? It cannot be simply theft and robbery, for it would manifestly be impossible for him, in his flying costume, to perpetrate burglary or highway robbery, or to pick pockets. It cannot be plumbing for obvious reasons, neither can it be the sale of books published by subscription only. Yet the flying villain must have an object, and we have a right to assume that only a peculiarly nefarious object could induce a man to fly to New Jersey or St. Louis in hot weather, and without an umbrella or mosquito net. It has not escaped notice that of late Mr. Talmadge has been wandering in the West in search of entertaining varieties of crime wherewith to embellish his sermons. It is also known that he returned to this city just before the flying man of Kenai Island was seen. Now, if there is a man in this country whose arms and legs are fitted to endure the muscular strain inseparable from the act of flying, that man is Mr. Gazedger Talmadge. He has preached for years with those graceful limbs, and must have developed and hardened their muscles to an extent which would fill every other professional acrobat with envy. What is more probable than that Mr. Talmadge has equipped himself with wings in order to study interesting types of immorality from the lofty height of a thousand feet. He has flown over St. Louis and Kentucky precisely the places which might be expected to yield a rich reward to an investigator of crime, and he is now flying to and fro over Kenai Island, preparatory to preaching a scathing sermon on the wickedness and indecencies of our bathing resorts. Here we have a natural and probable explanation of the flying man and it is earnestly to be hoped that no one, with mistaken zeal for field sports, will attempt to shoot the preacher on the wing with a shotgun. There is not a shotgun in existence which will do any good at a distance of a thousand feet. When I had 16 years old, I was in my friend's house watching a movie, and after I come back to my house, walking on the street normally, was 1.30 a.m. when I arrival in my house, I gone to my room and go front the mirror. I didn't turn on the light in this moment, I used my phone's flashlight. So in this exactly moment I saw a pale man behind me, with straight black hair, looking at me for three five seconds and I could felt my skin creeps like never before in my whole life. I was so scarred with this, I couldn't sleep well in this night. I had overthinking in this thing for few years, but couldn't found something about it. I don't, what is it? On September 18th, an unsettling incident unfolded involving my dad's friend and a terrifying creature known as the Dogman. This creature had brutally killed his 130 pound dog. The dog had a poignant backstory as it was a gift from his wife's late uncle. Before his passing, the uncle had entrusted her with the dog, and she had promised to care for it. One night, the dog's instincts kicked in, sensing a looming danger. It began barking incessantly, indicating a perceived threat. Despite their efforts, the dog managed to escape from their home. Tragically, the following morning revealed a grim sight. The lifeless body of the dog lay on their porch, its entrails savagely torn apart. In response, Justin, the dad's friend, moved the dog's remains to another location, intending to return later to bury it. However, upon his return, he was met with confusion and disbelief the dog's body had disappeared without a trace. Seeking answers, he reviewed the footage from his trail camera and was met with a chilling revelation the camera had captured images of the dogman itself. Unfortunately, I don't possess the actual pictures of the dogman. The incident left Justin's wife profoundly distraught, grappling with the loss of their beloved pet and the unsettling encounter with the enigmatic dogman.
I have lived in Florida almost my entire life, and right now I live in Central Florida, so this is terrifying. When I was about eight, we rented a place that was on one of the main streets of our town. Without being too specific, this was in Pinellas County. My brother and I would walk our dog down the main road, and occasionally we would see a dead animal. We would just assume that it was roadkill from the night before. It was always opossums and raccoons, so this was the most logical conclusion. This went on for weeks, maybe months. As time went on, there were more and more dead animals, and we noticed they were always in one yard. As time went on, we noticed the animals got more and more exotic. For example, one time there was a dead snapping turtle. This would not have been roadkill in the area because there wasn't water around this specific area, and we had never seen this type of turtle nearby. So whoever lived there had been slowly collecting more dead animals as time went on. It was freaky shit, especially for an eight and six year old. We eventually told our parents and some other family, and my grandma brushed it off by saying that in her old neighborhood, people would nail dead animals to trees, so this wasn't a big deal. Still weird and oddly out in the open on this large road. It is still creepy to think that this was going on so close to home. And now after your story, the feeling is back. First, let me just say I'm a former U.S. park ranger. I have been assigned to various parks all throughout the USA. Back in 1991, I was assigned to the Isle Royale National Park in Lake Superior. It was my job to patrol almost 100 miles of backcountry and write reports on the conditions of several trails. I would rotate my patrol route every couple of weeks to avoid getting too familiar with the backcountry and kept myself alert. During the first part of late August, I rotated to the west end of the island, to the Greenstone area. The Greenstone is located on the northeastern part of the island. It is like a pile of massive rocks on a point overlooking Lake Greenstone Cove. The area around this point is a well-known spot for the Native Americans, for making tools and other items from the Greenstone and for fishing. The area is also reputed to be very haunted, and some of the stories are quite horrifying. This place is covered in very thick spruce forest, and there are only a couple of trails that even cut through. One of the trails is called the Greenstone Shore Trail. It cuts through the forest and is on the shore of the lake. It is a very isolated area, and the only way in or out of the area is by barge or via the Greenstone Shore Trail. So I was patrolling the southern point of the trail when I came across a clearing. I stood there and began to hear a very strange noise. The noise sounded like a long, low moan that changed to a very loud, sputtering noise. I stood there and listened for a few more moments and decided that I'd better go check it out. I walked into the clearing, scanning the area. I could see a series of old fire pits in the area, and something dark lying on the ground about 50 feet away. It was heavy, whatever this was which I initially thought was a bear turned out to be on four legs. So I took up my binoculars and looked but couldn't really see any details on the animal. I thought it might be a bear, but its shape was beginning to look too big. I stood there for a while as it was still sputtering and moaning, and keep in mind it was kind of tucked away in tall grass. I began to believe that maybe this was a sick or injured bear or animal. So, I ventured around to see if I could get a better view by getting closer to it without directly in its line of sight. When I did, the animal disappeared entirely, but the groaning sound stayed. There's no way something this large could have gotten up and disappeared from my sight that easily. Something was off, I could feel it. After it disappeared, the woods around me went completely silent and I had this creeping feeling in my stomach that I needed to leave now and that I was in imminent danger. And then, the horrifying thought raced in my brain. What if it was a ploy? What if I was dealing with a large predator, and that was just a way to lure me into the open where I'd be more vulnerable? As these thoughts went through my head, I did not think rationally or clearly. I just got out of the area and did my best to quell my emotions. Now, two days after the incident in question, 
I was in the ranger station filling out reports when the dispatcher began yelling for me to come over the radio. It was a message from the Greenstone Ranger Station. There had been an accident a couple of miles north of the Greenstone Station, and they required my assistance. I got on the boat and headed over there. I met two other boats from the station, and we headed to where the accident occurred. Apparently, four people in the accident who were injured were being chased by some large black animal that they were convinced was Bigfoot. They explained that it had a large snout, huge teeth, and large claws. We took their statements. They were so scared and shaken up they had an accident by getting into their boat, smacking it into each other. Unfortunately, they're all okay with only minor injuries. But the boats, well, that's a different story. I often reflect back and wonder if there's any correlation to the large figure I saw in the tall grass there in that meadow, and what they described as seeing from the distance. I was at it was really hard to tell what exactly I was looking at. Even though it resembled a bear, I could tell it was a large animal, but because of how it was laying and how much of its body was truly concealed, there was no way to really know what it was for sure unless I got closer. But the strange groaning and moaning sounds, I'm not sure how to describe it or really write it off or rationalize it. I've heard bears make noise, even deer dying and injured, but this was different. It was so bassy in tone and the sound was different. I guess it's safe to say that I'm a little creeped out by the whole thing. And after taking these witnesses' statements, I really don't believe them to be making up stories. They were all visibly shaken. The one man, the bigger, older man, was actually shaking really bad, and he almost had tears in his eyes as we were all detailing the same story. Even though this was many years ago now, it sticks with me just like it happened last week. The air was crisp and laden with the aroma of dinner cooking over an open fire. My partner and I, two dedicated prospectors, had set up camp along the tranquil upper Wolf Creek. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows through the towering trees, we were lost in the camaraderie of shared stories and the promise of what the next day's prospecting might bring. But then, as if the forest itself had been jolted awake, a sudden commotion erupted from the woods. We turned our heads just in time to catch a glimpse of a bear a massive creature sprinting through the underbrush. It bounded past our campsite, its powerful form creating a blur of fur and muscle as it splashed through the creek and disappeared into the darkness on the other side. We exchanged astonished glances, our hearts racing from the unexpected encounter. Our surprise was far from over. For mere moments after the bear's passing, another thunderous sound reverberated through the air. We swiveled our heads, our eyes widening in disbelief. There, following the exact path as the bear, was an immense figure, towering and covered in hair. It was a Bigfoot, a creature often relegated to the realm of myths and legends, now running before our very eyes. The Bigfoot, every bit as swift as the bear, leaped over the creek with a grace that belied its size, disappearing into the shadows beyond. Our jaws dropped in unison, and a stunned silence settled over our camp. The forest seemed to hold its breath, as if acknowledging the rarity of the spectacle we had just witnessed. After what felt like an eternity, one of us finally managed to find his voice. What did you just see? The words hung in the air, a testament to the bewildering reality of the situation. Slowly we approached the creek, our hearts still racing, and our minds struggling to comprehend the improbable sequence of events that had unfolded before us. At the water's edge, we knelt down and examined the ground, our fingers tracing the impressions left behind by the passing creatures. There, side by side, were the tracks of both the bear and the Bigfoot. One giant print was superimposed over the outline of a bear's paw, a visual representation of the unlikely convergence of two enigmatic beings. Days later, still awestruck by our encounter, we shared our story with our fellow National Guardsmen during our monthly meeting in Grants Pass. Excitement radiated from us as we recounted the tale of the bear and the Bigfoot, the unlikely companions that had sprinted through our camp with a reckless abandon, completely unbothered by our presence. As the unit sergeant listened to our account, 
He could sense the sincerity in our voices and the awe that still lingered in our eyes. He had no doubt that we had experienced something truly extraordinary. It was a moment that would forever bind us, a memory etched in our minds, a testament to the mysteries that still linger within the depths of the forest, waiting to be uncovered by those fortunate enough to bear witness. I was packing supplies into a shelter on the long trail. I was 10 or 11. I got 10 bucks for it each time I did it. I am coming back out and I hear a dog barking. I think, cool, someone is hiking with their dog. Then I hear another dog bark and another and another until there were about 20 different voices and I felt the hairs on the back of my neck go stiff. They could not have been much more than a couple hundred yards away. I knew there was no way to avoid or outrun them, so I climbed the nearest pine tree I could get to. I was up about 20 feet when this pack of wild dogs arrived and proceeded to circle the tree, occasionally following my scent up the tree trunk. Then they decided to try and wait me out. Only one person knew I was packing in, and he wasn't going to be home until 10.30 at night. So we waited. All I had was a buck knife and a wrist rocket so I made the wait as painful as possible. When I ran out of rocks, I used pine cones, small green ones. I may have peed on them a few times too. It was dark when they decided to leave. I walked home after collecting a handful of stones, met my dad on the road going home, never so glad to crawl into bed. My dad was a professional land surveyor and I would work for him on weekends or during the summer. We were doing some work in a large conservation area and had parked the truck in a wide path that was supposed to be only open to environmental police and such, but there was obviously illegal dumping. We were going back to the truck for lunch, and when we stepped out onto the path near the truck, it was surrounded by at least half a dozen bikers who had broken the driver's side window and thrown all the gear out looking for stuff to steal. We were about 50 feet from them, and it felt like hours of silence when one of them said to the others, He saw us, they can identify us. I was 11 or 12, I don't really remember, but I was old enough to know what he was insinuating. My dad stepped in front of me, made a gesture with his hand that was holding his machete a common tool for land surveyors, and said, We didn't see anything, we're just working. Now I know for a fact my dad was capable of hurting people, even his own kids, and he could scrap. After a long pause, they backed away, got on their bikes and left. My dad had us pack up only the important or expensive gear stakes and property bound stayed and drove us out of there in the other direction. I've never seen him be that reckless with a truck before or after. With we got to a nearby convenience store, my body and mind completely drained of adrenaline, and I lost it. I couldn't even stand. I couldn't believe those people were going to kill us just because we caught them breaking into our car, but they absolutely were. My dad was a shit person. He was abusive and mentally ill. But there were a few times he showed he didn't hate me, and that was one of them. Hiking in Colorado through some old train tunnels with a friend, not far off from a fairly populated area. The train tunnels were fascinating, blasted out of mountain with some quite long, requiring headlamps, but definitely wouldn't want to be there alone. We eventually dead-ended so backtracking the way we came. As we exited one tunnel, there was a severed deer head in the middle of the path that wasn't there the first time we walked through. Not a recent kill, but still fully fleshed. On our way into the area, there were some tents that were clearly used by homeless individuals, maybe 150 yards off the path. We took it as a clear sign we weren't welcome and needed to leave immediately. I always try to be on high alert, but this is not only because I'm often in the woods, but then I'm also often by myself and people are known to do some pretty dumb things out here. I want to be out here to keep them safe. For the most part, this is routine. People though, for the most part, are generally well behaved when they're out camping, but sometimes things can get weird. 
On this occasion, it started off as normal enough. I was by myself, patrolling the campsite during the night, not really expecting anything to happen. I was looking up at the sky and I saw something that caught my attention, but whatever it was was moving along the tree line. I didn't think much of it at first. I assumed it was maybe some sort of animal or bird, but as I watched, it became clear that it wasn't an animal at all. This was some sort of hideous creature, probably not an animal I've ever seen before. It was tall and gaunt, long arms and a very thin frame. I could make out some sort of hair, but it was too dark to determine this thing's color. It had a long snout like that of a wolf or a dog, eyes that glowed dimly green. Its legs were incredibly long, and so the stride was almost comical as it walked away. I was terrified beyond belief by its sight, but I didn't want to show myself until it came closer. Even though this thing seemed to be headed towards the campsite, I couldn't leave everybody at my site vulnerable. I waited until about 10 feet from the camp before I stood up from my hiding place, firing a shot into the air. It stopped dead in its tracks as if it were confused as to what I was doing. I think it also realized there were humans at this campsite now, and we were all very vulnerable. It paused for a moment before it turned and ran back the way it came towards the tree line. I fired another shot, but this one missed. I was too panicked to aim properly, and I got away with whatever mischief it had in mind. I woke up the rest of the campers, told them what had happened. I only saw it for a few seconds, but it's burned into my memory like a brand. That thing, whatever I shot at, was pure evil. I never went out patrolling alone at night ever again after this. I'm a 16-year-old dude, and this happened a few weeks ago. I'm fairly chill and I just live with my grandfather on the east side Kentucky, barely above the Tennessee line. I'm a big guy and typically I don't do anything particularly bad. I don't smoke, I don't dip, I don't even drink. To be clear, my grandfather is 76 and has just about beaten some type of leukemia. I'm a welding nerd also, it's the thing I enjoy most at school. Sometimes when I can't sleep or I wake up in the middle of the night, I put on some clothes and go outside to my shed. My shed is really a spare two-car garage with metal working equipment inside. I find the sound of the arcs pleasing to my ear while I'm tired and it can help me ease my mind as I'm a nervous person to begin with. Now, if you're not familiar with Eastern Kentucky, it's like a bowl, mountains surround you 360 and thing like coyotes and snakes are common to see rummaging about at night. They don't really scare me because the path to my shed is well lit and concrete. I have a few windows in the building, all but two are broken out from stupid shit. I did as a little kid the inside of the shop is actually brighter than my bedroom. There's plenty of light so I turned my ventilation on, set up my welder and started welding on some scrap metal to practice the 3F position. Echo vertical welding with a small process. I do this a lot and no one really minds as my ventilation system is rather quiet and you'd have the hearing of a bat to notice it in another house. I'm sat there in my metal stool and something is wrong. I'm a pretty talented welder by nature, it comes as natural to me as breathing. So when my welds looked shaky, and there was spatter everywhere, I knew something was wrong. My welder was set right, so I hadn't bumped it with my knee when welding. I heard something like a cowbell, my neighbor has a cow in his yard so I figured she got out it happens a lot. So I looked outside and didn't see her. Anywhere. This isn't a calf, this is a nearly full-grown cow that weighs upwards of 1 in 200 pounds, they don't just vanish into thin air. I checked another window and I could barely see anything. My shed may be bright, but the trees block most of that light at night, but I did see something. Now I kinda wish and hadn't seen it. It was deformed, weird and long, it had fur. So I thought I was just looking at a coyote pack, but no. This thing was too big to be a coyote or a wolf and too skinny to be a bear. Imagine a stereotypical Bigfoot and starve him that's what this looked like. Somehow it was more greasy and horrible than I first thought. I turned my welder off and then ran back into my house. I grabbed a flare gun and headed back outside. 
Looking back on this, I really don't know why I didn't grab my grandfather's rifle. I have a hunting permit, and this thing is on my property. Somehow in my head, shooting a flare at it was the best idea since inventing electricity. So I opened the window and shot a flare at the thing. I don't think I regret anything more than I regret that. It looked up, and its face was horrifying like a bulldog. Its face was scrunched up and small, protruding out just enough to notice, and to make it all worse it was on a big round head. It looked at me, howled a screech and ran. I guess the flare was as scary to it as it was to me. I found out that my neighbor's cow had had the bell stolen off of it and been scratched deeply in the neck, back, and the legs. I told everyone about what I saw, and what worries me now is that another neighbor of mine claims to have seen it too. It took a chicken of his. In 1947, I was heavily involved with the military, and I was also a pilot. I was assigned to work with an intelligence unit located right at the Pentagon. I was only 19 at the time, just out of high school. I was very idealistic, and I wanted to serve my country. I remember all the major newspapers and media outlets were talking about flying saucers. The news was all over the place about how these UFOs were appearing in the skies. Nobody was able to get them on radar, though. It was simply pandemonium, as some people thought it was the Russians, some people thought it was Sputnik. The media spread all kinds of crazy theories that were way ahead of their time. Most people thought these flying saucer things were some kind of top-secret government project, but they weren't sure what the government was actually doing about it. It didn't help that just months later in 1948, the U.S. Smaken had crashed into the Pacific Ocean, and the story broke that the Navy had been flying around in apparently giant airships they also crashed and it was never fixed, but we managed to keep it a secret for some time. In the meantime, the Pentagon told all of us that our job was to keep watching these things. They were always appearing somewhere, the stories were all over the place, but most of them were coming out of the Southwest. I remember my commanding officer telling us that if we spot one of these things, to abandon our post, do not engage. If we were in a war zone, the order was to shoot first, ask questions later, like the recording in the transcript. It was a very stressful time. I remember your typical media outlets having a field day. Since there was no internet, you can turn on the radio. You'd hear all kinds of wild theories and explanations about what these things could have been. I was assigned to do lots of research and analysis at the Pentagon. Most of what we were doing involved watching for saucers and checking out the military's radar systems. We were told to be on the lookout for attacks from Russia or any other Soviet-affiliated countries. I didn't see a flying saucer myself until 1952. It was one of the most frightening experiences that I had during my entire tenure in the military. I was in the Air Force at the time I had only about 23 or 24 years old. I was stationed in a small base near Area 51 in Nevada. I was still working with the same unit, but now it's much smaller. We had our own little compound on the base. That's where we constructed all of our work. The base didn't even have a name, so we called it S-4, and that's how everybody would refer to it. At the time, we only had around six or seven people, including our commanding officer. The UFOs stopped appearing after 1952 because we apparently figured out how to catch them on radar using special technology. The media had stopped talking about them for a time, but things began to heavily escalate shortly before Vietnam. Many years later, there was another incident in 1959. A military cargo plane had crashed into a remote section of the Sierra Nevadas. The wreckage was spread out across the mountains, and we had to do all kinds of intense field work to track every piece down. The Air Force informed us that these things weren't from Earth. What was on that plane, we had to secure the scene as best as we could. I was only a first lieutenant at the time and didn't really know much about these things until we began receiving orders from Washington that we had to abandon any and all posts until we found out what these objects were. I was interrogating one of the survivors from the crash. He was the only one who knew anything. He told me he didn't remember much about where they came from, but it wasn't of this universe. 
He had a lot of injuries, and he was banged up pretty badly. We were told by our commanding officer to bring him back to the base at S-4. When I got to the base, I saw that the other officers were guarding an alien body that had crashed into the ground somewhere. It looked like a huge insect, but with two arms that were attached to its torso. It had a small hidden body covered in hard chitin. It was very scary looking, but it had been dead for several hours. We didn't have to worry about it attacking us. Turns out this was a cargo plane carrying the bodies of aliens down towards Mexico. I got a chance myself to look at the body when my commanding officer told me about what the alien survivor had said. He explained that these things were very real, whatever they were, they were definitely not from Earth origin, and the government had known about these things for a long time. Even the survivor who I won't name was actually the second person on record to talk about them. It made me wonder if there was a survivor from the crash I found who's willing to spill the beans, and many of us in the military at the time referred to them by the others. They were very technologically advanced, so much so they could have wiped us off the face of this planet if they'd really wanted to. We were in a cold war with them, after all. We'd been sending in our transmissions into space for decades now. The signals we put out are very specific and include everything from mathematical equations to images of our solar systems. We've been doing it for a long time, so essentially telling them exactly where to find us as a part of our project. In 1965, we had a horrific incident at one of our undisclosed locations underneath Chicago. We had a secret foreign technology testing facility. Several subjects had begun to mutate, including some of the workers that were exposed to hazardous chemicals. The strange thing about this incident is that there were no survivors. There were several bodies of military personnel that were found in the aftermath of this incident. We eventually pieced together what happened between some bodies and a few survivors, but it was too late to save them all. The ones that were mutated became stronger, faster, and much more resilient. They had increased their mass beyond what we could really understand. Thankfully, our cleanup crew was able to handle it all before things got too out of hand. I know it sounds terrifying, but our military was capable of handling them. Since the 1970s came, things changed for the worse. They were pushing for bigger, more unethical projects, intermixing human DNA, advanced bioweaponry, and all sorts of experimentation really began happening. Our military technology at the time had increased exponentially as well. We were told that we would have our own alien technology within the next few years. I had started working on these few projects, but had some moral issues with some other stuff they were doing. I heard about horrific experiments on human beings, but our superiors kept telling us it had to happen for the sake of the country. We began to notice that UFOs were being sighted more frequently right around military bases, and it got to a point where most of our technology was being crushed by superior alien forces. We had this massive accident in 1979 that took a massive toll on both our military and their technology. The incident had occurred in 1979, and it was just after the Iranian Revolution where they gained control of our embassy in capturing our people. The technology we had at the time was enough to cause some pretty bad damage, but not as much as it could have been. Of course, this was all just the beginning. They had more technology than what we were able to understand, intimidating us into surrendering whole countries to them without firing a single shot. We were literally at their mercy, not having enough firepower to really cause any damage. This, of course, all happened under the table, beyond the sight of the public eye. There are only ever a handful of people right now alive that even have knowledge of this, besides whoever decides to read this. It is the moral obligation of every single person to spread this information. The others were very much real, and this is all very true. The experiences that I've shared with you today have changed my life forever. I have so much more I can share, but I figured it's best to break these up into smaller posts. So I'm going to end this here. I'll see you in the next one. My mother and I saw a bird that followed the car up a mountain road near Maysville, West Virginia. We saw only the tail and the underside of this animal. 
Its wings were almost as wide as the road. This animal repeatedly flew over the hood of the car as we drove. It did not have a feathered tail. Its tail looked long and coiled up. It was dark in color. When we witnessed this, I told my mother that it looked like a prehistoric bird. This animal was much larger than a turkey, turkey buzzard, owl, eagle, hawk, or any other bird of prey that I have ever seen. It had a broad, heavy body. In fact, it looked so large that it had trouble getting airborne, and it used the path of the road to get up in the air. This bird looked large enough to easily take down a dog or deer-sized animal. I cannot say that it had any man-like features, but this was something that both myself and my mother still remember. I have to believe that other people witnessed what we saw, and I can see why they called it Mothman. This is a true story for obvious reasons. I can see that people blow it off as untrue, but we know the truth. I know another person in Maysville, WV, that has described something similar. He explained to me he did not know what it was, but it was as big as the highway is wide. My home away from home is the woods. Specifically, it's the woods of Mission Tejas State Park, 21 miles northeast of Crockett, Texas. I work as a park ranger, taking church groups and school trips through the forest, showing them the woods I so dearly love. I also show them relics from the local Caddo Indians that used to live there, as well as pioneers who settled a couple of miles away at the Rice House. Back home, I have a wife who is retired, and my best friends. I love my wife and friends, but the park is like that friend you never really talk to, but you get to know and enjoy their company. I am at peace with the local wildlife, which I have known all my life. On breaks, I drive a couple of feet off the trail, find a stump and sit down. I am at peace in the forest. I love my job, and I make damn sure that everyone else will too. My fantastic stories of caddo hunts and local legends are loved by all. I make sure that everyone at least knows about what happened. One day, I am taking a group of school kids out on a walk. I talk about the deer, the birds, and the pines that seem to stretch up for miles. I am leading the group up a steep hill when suddenly, I become dizzy and short of breath. I think of this as merely the result of my aging body. Then, I begin feeling pressure in my chest. A small alarm is ringing in my head, but then I blame the bean-eating competition I had the night before with my wife and friends at the local Mexican restaurant. It is only when my left arm begins to feel as though a thousand volts of electricity had pumped into it that I begin to have concern. I know exactly what is happening, a heart attack. Before I can cry for help though, I collapse. I come to moments later, dazed and confused. I get up and catch movement out of the corner of my eye. The curious ex-Vietnam vet stumbles, then walks up the hill, as if nothing is wrong. At the top of the hill is a group of people dressed like the local Caddo Indians. They seem to have been led by a young woman holding a baby. They seem to be dressed right, but something just doesn't feel right. Who are you? I ask. Nothing. Can anyone answer me? No response. Well, look. It's been a nice conversation we've had here, but I need to get back. Thank you, says the woman. What? I stammer out, dumbfounded. You are the man who has told our story when no one else would. For that, we thank you. From behind the woman, a small army has amassed. Indians, settlers, ranchers, soldiers, anyone who had lived and died on the park's land. Finally regaining my composure, I reply, well, y'all are more than welcome. Now, if you excuse me, I need to do my job. The Caddo woman gives me a sad smile, saying, I'm afraid you can't do that anymore, John. You're going to be here now. Confused, I turn around. At the bottom of the hill is chaos. My crumpled body lies still in the cool, moist clay. Meanwhile, some parents are performing CPR on my vacant body, while others try to get help and still others are trying to comfort the kids. Some of the kids are crying, while others are sitting, trying to wrap their young minds over what had just happened. Some of the bigger, more curious ones are trying to poke my body with sticks and fingers, trying to see if I would move and somehow, some way, jump back to life. Everyone has their own ideas on what to do, 
But panic, then desperation, then realization set in, one after the other. I am dead and nothing can be done. I watch all of this from the top of the hill, my spirit's presence unbeknownst to the others. Rangers swarm onto the scene, put a blanket over my body, place it into the back of a jeep, and drive off. Suddenly, Mexican food doesn't taste as good as I remembered it before. Hey, just before I explain the story, I want to clarify a few points. First, this occurred in the United Kingdom. I understand that this is a SW subreddit, but it really does fit the criteria and you seem like experts regarding this topic more than anyone. Second, this wasn't a dream or hallucination. Whilst on a late night walk, me and my sister heard or witnessed this. It is corroborated and on a late walk, perhaps around 10, 30, 11, me and my sister took a path through a churchyard and through some fields. Approaching an enclave in the next field, however, we heard a scream. It was not like an animal, nor human the harmony of both high and deep was rattling. Like a man screaming, crossed with a dying animal. There was a hedge in our way, obstructing vision. Whatever it was, it lay behind the hedge. We both looked forward and saw the silhouette of a tall, crooked thing. It was on two legs, though its back was hunched forward, its head long and with jagged teeth. We didn't know what it was, nor did we want to. In any case, without speaking to each other, we ran in the opposite direction. Both of us. I am a coward, but my sister is tough as nails. She wouldn't simply run from an animal's cry. And yet, we both ran. Any thoughts about what it was? I had a group of friends who used to get together and play manhunt in a local park at night. Just a different way of saying a big game of hide and seek tag, where three people start off it, and everyone else goes and hides in the park. As they find and tag people, they become it, as well until eventually there is only one three people left, then we start again, and play into early morning. Well one night I was it with my friend and his younger brother. We were heading to the middle of the park, to a hot spot for hiding places. There is a long stairwell that leads up a huge hill to a pavilion and field. We were slowly walking down those stairs, maybe halfway down when we noticed two folks way below us. Thinking it was one of our friends, we tell out, Hey, who's that? Instead of the normal reaction, which is to call out your name, then sprint away trying to avoid getting tagged, a strange voice responds, Who the F are you? We at first started sprinting down at them like we normally would. But then we realized they too were sprinting at us. We don't even hesitate. We turn around and sprint up the stairs as fast as we can, adrenaline kicking it, hairs sticking up on the back of my neck. We make it up on top of the hill and pause. When I look back and they are right behind us, not more than 10 feet away, which is absurdly fast because of how much distance we had had between us. We lose our shit and start sprinting as fast as possible to the park trail that wraps around the entire park and leads to a road where one of our friends live and that we use as a meet-up spot between games. It's a two-mile run back from where we are so we book it, sprinting as if our lives depended on it, occasionally looking back and seeing the two people following behind. As we get nearer our energy is spent, but we push on and make it to the street looking back, and there is no sign of the two strangers. All of our group is back at the house, lounging on the driveway, having decided to prank us that night. And while we were off in the park searching for them, they would meet back at the house until we gave up. We shared our story with them and some laughed in disbelief. Others wanted to search the park for those two randoms, but we never discovered who they were. All I know is that they were incredibly fast and shady as F. When I was younger, I went to a state park with my family. There's a fairly large hiking trail up a hill that leads to a cave. Well, me being a child, I thought they were taking too long, so I took off up the trail into the woods, ended up losing the trail and screaming for help for a good 20 minutes. I fully convinced myself that I could survive for at least two days, build a shelter, and catch some food. I'm glad they found me before I set up camp. 
Another time I had just woken up from my first night on a camping trip and decided to walk to the lake. About five minutes into my walk, I look to my left and see five wild boars about 20 yards from me. That was possibly scarier than the first in incident. The crisp autumn air cut through the night as we sat around the campfire, the warm glow flickering against the canvas of our RV. My husband, Mike, and our 10-year-old daughter, Emma, were nestled inside, sharing stories and laughter. The remote wilderness of Kansas surrounded us, a perfect backdrop for a family camping trip. As the night deepened, a sudden crackling of branches disturbed our peaceful gathering. I exchanged glances with Mike, and a silent agreement passed between us to investigate. Grabbing a flashlight, we stepped outside into the chilly darkness. The moon cast an eerie glow over the trees, and that's when we saw them two children standing just beyond the circle of light. Their eyes reflected the beam of the flashlight, making them appear pale and otherworldly. A shiver ran down my spine as they timidly approached us. Can you help us? The smaller one asked, his voice barely more than a whisper. His companion, a slightly older girl, stood beside him, her eyes filled with an unsettling sadness. Mike and I exchanged glances, torn between a desire to help and a growing unease. Despite their eerie appearance, they seemed so innocent. With a nod, we followed the children into the woods. The night pressed in around us, and the path seemed to twist and turn, making it impossible to maintain our bearings. After what felt like hours, the children suddenly vanished into thin air, leaving us alone in the quiet, haunting stillness of the forest. Panic set in as we realized we were utterly lost. The trees loomed overhead like silent sentinels, and every attempt to retrace our steps only led us deeper into the labyrinth of shadows. Fear crept into our hearts, and whispers of doubt filled the air. Hours turned into a day, our journey through the woods reminiscent of a nightmare. Desperation gripped us until, like a mirage in the desert, we stumbled upon our RV. Relief washed over us as we hastily climbed inside, shutting the door behind us. Exhausted and bewildered, we left that desolate place behind, the mystery of those ghostly children lingering in our minds. As we drove away, the landscape gradually shifted from the haunted woods to the familiar sights of civilization. In the safety of daylight, doubts lingered. Were those children real, lost like us in the vast wilderness, or were they something else entirely? The uncertainty clung to us like the shadows of the night, a chilling reminder of a camping trip forever etched in our memories. One night my friend and I decided to hike to the top of this small mountain at night for a meteor shower. There were four of us, all around 16 at the time, and thought it would be cool. We drove over and started hiking. We took a break about halfway when we noticed there was a guy following us. In a business suit, we were weirded out so we decided to start back up and walk a bit faster. But by the next time we stopped he was like 10 feet away, so we bit the bullet to see if he'd just walk by. He didn't. He stopped and asked if we were there for the meteor shower and if he could walk with us. Weird a 30-something year old man in a suit wanting to hike with four 16-year-olds but whatever. As we were walking my friend and I noticed he was walking really close to our friend the only girl in the group like he could smell her shampoo close. We got to the top, sat down, and he sat down almost right up on our friend. With her reasonably freaked out I made an excuse on why we have to leave early, and we promptly booked it the F out of there, nearly running the entire way down. When we got back to the car we thought, cool, we ditched the weirdo. But no. When we were all in the car, our my friend pointed out that this guy is full on sprinting down the trail and towards our car with a large stick. Being in a car, we just drove out of there very shook up. We chalked it up to some dude on some hell of a drug. But two days later, we all got a text linking us to a news report about a guy that had strangled his wife and then proceeded to kill another girl later that night on a hiking trail. It was the guy, the same dude at the same hiking trail. We never told our parents about the incident and never went back there.
ever. I was with a fire crew checking on a water source. I stopped and sat on a rock as the crew went ahead. The area was a free-range area. The cows that were in the meadow began to bellow, and I watched them all run to the northern side of the meadow. I first thought there might be a cougar amongst the cliff area. I then scanned the ridge and noticed something standing at the edge of the cliff. I thought it might have been like a burnt tree there. Then it began to turn from side to side, and I then could see it had a head and shoulder form to it. After a few seconds, it turned and walked back towards the wooded area. I'll never forget that eerie camping trip near Fish Lake, Oregon, which took place about seven, ten years ago. It was a peculiar experience that still sends shivers down my spine whenever I think about it. You see, my friend and I were both avid believers in the existence of Bigfoot, and we decided to set up camp in the heart of the wilderness near the Pacific Crest Trail, not too far from Klamath Falls. As night fell and the forest grew darker, we huddled around our crackling campfire, sharing stories and laughs. Little did we know that our own story was about to unfold in the most unexpected way. It was well past midnight when the first bone-chilling screams shattered the tranquility of the night. Terrible, frightening screams that echoed through the trees and seemed to pierce the very fabric of reality. We froze in our places, our hearts pounding like tribal drums, our eyes locked on each other's faces, seeking some reassurance that what we were hearing wasn't just a figment of our imagination. The screams continued, relentless and haunting, lasting for what felt like an eternity five to ten agonizing minutes that sent chills down my spine. The night seemed to stretch on forever. The forest transformed into an otherworldly realm where fear and curiosity waged a fierce battle within us. As dawn broke, the screams finally subsided, leaving behind an eerie silence that seemed almost more unsettling. Determined to unravel the mystery, my friend and I embarked on a journey into the depths of the forest, tracing the direction from which the screams had originated. Following the trail through the underbrush, we stumbled upon indistinct tracks in the soft, damp earth. These tracks were unlike anything we'd ever seen before large and elongated, leaving a trail of intrigue in their wake. But the strangest discovery lay ahead. There, in the middle of one of the tracks, was a lifeless baby porcupine, its tiny body squashed as if by some unseen force. The sight was jarring, and a shiver ran down my spine as a thought crossed my mind. Could this be what the creature was screaming about? My friend, ever the intrepid adventurer, decided to cast one of the tracks as evidence of our encounter. As he worked meticulously, I couldn't help but glance around nervously, half expecting some hidden presence to reveal itself at any moment. With the cast in hand and a deep sense of trepidation, we began our journey back to camp, our thoughts swirling with the enigmatic events of the past night. Upon returning, we couldn't help but share our experience with Mike, a fellow believer in the mysterious and unexplained. Mike was intrigued, and he promised to try and secure a photograph of the casted track for us to share with others. Our story had taken a curious turn, as the events of that night remained etched in our memories, a haunting reminder that the wild still held secrets beyond our understanding. To this day, whenever I gaze into the depths of a forest or hear a distant howl in the night, I am transported back to that fateful camping trip near Fish Lake, Oregon. The memory of those screams and the inexplicable tracks serve as a constant reminder that there are mysteries in this world that elude explanation, waiting to be uncovered by those daring enough to venture into the unknown. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.